During the coffee break, morning changed to afternoon. So good afternoon to everybody, not only to, 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 to those of you present here at the Academy, but also to those of you joining us at home on Zoom. Our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Livnat Holtzman of the Department of Arabic of Bar Ilan University. Professor Holtzman specializes in Islamic theology and hadith. She has written about the religious thought of Ibn Taymiyyah and his pupil Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah and has recently published a book entitled Anthropomorphism in Islam. This is a study of a hadith as sifat that is, depictions of the deity in human form and in human terms, and the theological problems which such depictions entail. Professor Holtzman is currently working on a different topic, the gestures, physical mannerisms, and body language of the Prophet Muhammad as reported in Islamic literature. This is an interesting subject to which Goltzir himself had devoted considerable attention. Goltzir worked on many aspects of Islam. He is probably most famous for his remarkable studies of Islamic hadith. One aspect of this forms the topic of Professor Holtzman's talk today. She will address us on the subject of Ignaz Goltzir and the theological hadith, Isnad analysis, and other reading strategies. Thank you, Professor Hopkins. And uh, thank you, Professor Friedman, for inviting me to speak in this very, very prestigious uh, forum. And um, I remember the phone talk that, uh, that we had, uh, I think it was more than a year ago, when you asked me to, to talk in this, uh, in this forum. And you specifically instructed me to speak about ISNAD analysis. So I said, OK, but I didn't know <laughs> that uh, I was capable of doing that. So you'll be the judge of it. Um, in El Kamal Fi Tariq, um, the formidable work of history of Ibn al athir this prominent historian from Mosul presents a brief account on the funeral of the great Hadith scholar, Quran exegete, and historian Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari. In a reserved and a matter of fact tone, Ibn al athir recounts that a Tabari aged 85 was buried at night in his house. According to Ibn al athir a Tabari died in his house, but it was impossible to move the body and take it to burial in the graveyard of Baghdad because the mob, al amma besieged the house during the day, thus preventing anyone from entering or leaving it. The raging crowd, which the author identifies as the Hanbalis of Baghdad, accuse the deceased of rafd and ilhad, namely inclining towards the Shia and holding heretical ideas. One of the pillars of the Baghdadi society, the wazir Ali ibn Isa, was extremely distressed because of this shameful situation. I swear to God, he declared, if you ask these people about the meaning of rafd and ilhad, they would have not known what to say because they had no idea what they were shouting. Ibn al athir who attributes this report to the historian Ibn Miskawai from Rai, rejects it altogether. Obviously, argues Ibn al athir a tabari, a beacon of traditionalism, was innocent of Shiism and heresy. Ibn Miskawai must have been misinformed about the reason for al amas display of zeal and fanaticism, ta'assub. According to Ibn al athir a tabari heard the feelings of the large community of the Baghdadi Hanbalis when he did not mention Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the eponymous founder of the Hanbali School of Law and Theology, in his book on the legal disagreements among the leading jurisprudence in the history of Islam, Ikhtilaf al-Fuqaha. A tabari in fact, did not consider Ahmad ibn Hanbal an expert of law, a faqih, but a teacher and a transmitter of hadith, muhaddith. From another historical source, we learn that there was another matter, much graver than the exclusion of Ahmad ibn Hanbal from at tabaris ikhtilaf al-Fuqaha. This was at tabaris reading of Hadith al-Julus ala al-Arsh, the Hadith about the sitting on the throne. Henceforth, Hadith al-Julus. <clears throat> Since this Hadith is the backbone of this present talk, I will briefly present it now. <clears throat> 
In hadith criticism, hadith al-julus is categorized as khabar al-wahid, namely a hadith transmitted by one individual narrator. The individual narrator in this case is Mujahid ibn Jabr, the Quran exegete from Mecca, who was one of the prominent disciples of the first and foremost commentator of the Quran, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas was a Sahabi, Mujahid was a Tabi'i. Hadith al-Julus presents Mujahid's exclusive and unparalleled interpretation of Quran Surah 17, verse 79. This Quranic verse and its preceding verse present God's promise to the Prophet Muhammad, quote, recite your prayers at sunset, at nightfall, and at dawn. The dawn prayer has, it wit has its witnesses. Pray during the night as well in an additional duty for the fulfillment of which your God may exalt you to an honorable station. So according to Hadith al-Julus, after Mujahid recited this part of the verse, and especially Maqam Mahmud, the honorable place, he explained to his disciples, God will sit him, Muhammad, on the throne. Yujlisuhu ala al-arsh. The unique interpretation of Mujahid to Quran 1779 circulated in Baghdad and was venerated by the Hanbalis. Al-Tabari refused to accept this hadith because it implied that the heavenly throne is a physical being on which God sits with the Prophet at his side. According to one report by the great historian Yaqut in his Mu'jam al-Udaba, At-Tabari bluntly remarked that God has no boon companion and therefore no one sits with him on his throne. This remark offended the Hanbalis greatly. As Ibn al-Athir describes the situation, quote, several Hanbalis leagued together against At-Tabari and disparaged him and others followed them, unquote. As the Hanbalis were the loud majority in Baghdad, At-Tabari's life became miserable. Yaqut, who was, by the way, Ibn al-Athir's acquaintance, describes a hair-raising scene in which the Hanbali mob attacked At-Tabari severely and nearly killed him. After this violent attack, At-Tabari lived in solitude. In fact, he was confined to his home, or as we say these days, went into lockdown for a year until his death. At-Tabari's shameful end and the events that preceded it drew the attention of the illustrious Ignaz Goltzier, whose fabulous scholarship we celebrate here today. Goltzier was fascinated by this extraordinary story and the imperceivable gap between the immense respect that At-Tabari's contemporaries held for him and the rage and violence that were directed against him during the year that preceded his death. Gautier examined the larger context of this episode. He described this event as part of the internal conflict that characterized the heterogeneous camp of the traditionalists, or Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people of the Sunnah and the consensus. Atabari's case and several other cases, all documented in the Chronicles, prove that the doctrinal conflicts were not restricted to the boundaries of the intellectual discussion. More often than not, these conflicts drew violent acts that soon deteriorated to street fights and riots. <clears throat> In the following lecture, I will evaluate Goltier's research on the case of At-Tabari and Hadith al-Julus, the hadith which presents Mujahid's understanding of Maqam Mahmud. Goldseher described this theological hadith in an extremely brief paragraph which appears in his groundbreaking 1920 monograph on the history of Quran exegesis. However, his description in this paragraph raises many questions and requires clarification. As often with the writings of Goldseher, this paragraph was mentioned in later research but the analysis that Gaultier almost offhandedly presents in this paragraph was never examined. Examining this paragraph in detail surfaces some conclusions about Gaultier's reading of the theological hadith, his regard or disregard to Isnad analysis, and his unique ability to puzzle out new and far-reaching insights from the sources. This conference seems like a good opportunity to start the examination of one paragraph from Die Richtungen der Islamischen Quran's Auslegung. This talk comprises three parts. <clears throat> 
In the first part, I will survey the three research trajectories that came out of Gaultier's interest in the case of At-Tabari and Hadith al-Julus. The second part offers my analysis of the relevant paragraph from Die Richtungen der Islamischen Koranauslegung. This analysis reconstructs Gaultier's reading in the sources. In the third part of the lecture, I describe the Hanbali effort to canonize Hadith al-Julus through a close reading of a paragraph from a creed, al-Itiqad, authored by the 6th slash 12th century Hanbali historian Ibn Abi Ya'la. Ibn Abi Ya'la's paragraph surfaces the uh, vig vigorous efforts that the Hanbalis made to establish the status of Hadith al-Julus as an iconic text. This paragraph by Ibn Abi Ya'la in a way complements Goldsier's aforementioned paragraph. This part of the lecture refers to the preliminary findings from my ongoing project on the Hanbali Creed, but let us first start with Goldsier's interest in the case of At-Tabari and Hadith al-Julus. <clears throat> in the second volume of Muhammadanish Ashtudin, Muslim Studies, published in 1890, Goldsier described At-Tabari's unfortunate incident with a storyteller, Qas that allegedly ignited the hostility of the Hanabila towards the Tabari. Goldsier's description is based on a rare anecdote which he located in a manuscript of Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti's Tadkirat al-Khawas. The manuscript is preserved in the Leiden Library. In 1895, Goldsier published an excerpt taken from the rather lengthy biographical entry on a Tabari authored by the Damascene historian Ibn as -Sakir. This excerpt also mentioned At-Tabari's ordeals caused by the Hanbalis. Gautier edited the Arabic source which he found in a two-volume manuscript of Tariq Dimashq. This manuscript was part of the private collection of Gautier's friend, Greff Carlo von Landberg Halberger. Gautier's brief observations on At-Tabari and the Hanbalis prompted other scholars to examine At-Tabari's case. In 1898, Martin Schreiner, who was Goldsier's uh, pupil, briefly referred to the scholarly dispute about Quran 1779 and Hadith al-Julus, and mentioned the violent events that erupted because of this Hadith in Baghdad in 317, that's six years after Atabari's death. In 1901, Friedrich Kern published an article about Atabari's Ikhtilaf al-Fuqaha, this article preceded Karen's 1902 edition of At-Tabari's Ikhtilaf al-Fuqaha. Karen's introduction to this edition summarized the main primary sources on At-Tabari's ordeals with the Hanbalis. In 1918, Tor André contributed a different observation to this event. He examined the content of Hadith al-Julus and At-Tabari's reading of that Hadith. Finally, in 1920, Goldsiher provided a different analysis to Atabari's misfortunes. This time, it seems that he relied on Tor Andre's groundbreaking analysis because here Goldsiher mentioned Quran 1779 and Hadith al Julus. Goldsiher and his contemporaries located <coughs> the most important historical sources on Atabari and Hadith al Julus. Their findings, however, were certainly, certainly not the final word on this case. On the contrary, Andre's observations from 1918 and Gautier's observations that heavily relied on Andre from 1920 were followed by a wave of publications on Mihnat al-Tabari ma'al Hanabila, as Taha Muhammad Najjar Ramadan aptly described it, and another wave of publications on a Tabari's reading of Quran 1779 and Hadith al-Julus. These publications, among which we mention Henri Laus, Louis Massignon, etc., 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 Franz Rosenthal, Claude Gillio, and Mustafa Shah, studied the historical sources, some of which were not accessible to Goldsier and André, and the theological sources, mostly Quran exegesis like a Tabari's. In sum, we divide the valuable scholarship on At-Tabari and Quran 1779 uh, into two groups. That's in the end of the slide. Uh, 
The first group are studies that uh, offer, the first group is studies that offer an historical analysis of Atabari's misfortune with the Hanbalis. The second group uh, is studies that examine Atabari's reading of Quran 7079. Yet Goltzia's study from 1920 the Richtungen, surfaced another research trajectory which branched off from the entangled affair of At-Tabari and Quran 7079. This trajectory is the transformation of Hadith al-Julus from a dictum taught by a Meccan Quran exegete, that is Mujahid, to an iconic text that played a decisive role in the Baghdadi society and in politics, Baghdadi politics. So Goldsihar located an entry in Ibn al athirs the Kamil Fit Tarikh, which, by the way, Wolfgang Ben, the editor and translator of the Richtung and the Islamischen Quran Auslegung, was mistaken to identify as Ust al Rabba. There is no connection between these two works, apart from the fact that they were written by Ibn al athir Based on this entry and a similar entry which Friedrich Kern located in Al Muqtafi, by the Mamluk historian Alam al-Din al-Birzali, <clears throat> based on these two um, um, passages, very um, brief passages, Gautier identified the prominent role that Hadith al-Julus, or Mujahid's interpretation of Quran 1779, played in the internal conflict among the heterogeneous community of Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah, the traditionalists. Although he relied on merely two brief historical entries, Gaultier provided an insightful, des insightful description of the riots in Baghdad in 317, which went beyond Schreiner's description. Gaultier was the first to realize that Hadith al-Julus became an icon of the Hanbali faith. Based on this Hadith, so Gaultier tells us, the Hanbalis led by one Ishaq al-Marwazi, believed that Maqam Mahmud means that God will offer the Prophet a place on his throne in return for his zealous devotions. As was the case in other articles of faith in the Hanbali creed, Aqidah or Itiqad, the Hanbalis were ready to attack whoever defamed Hadith al-Julus. <clears throat> Goltzia's presentation of the internal strife among the traditionalists, as we see it in the paragraph in the Richtung, and this is the paragraph that I'm speaking of, uh, is made in broad, broad strokes. His tone is confident. His statements are categorical. Yet Goltzia's decisiveness prompts questions. We have a Quranic verse which Mujahid a Tabir from Mecca interpreted, the literalist and zealous Hanbalis who adopted this Tabi'i's interpretation vehemently believed in it, while the other traditionalists rejected it. But how did this interpretation arrive to Baghdad and who was responsible for its circulation? The Hanbalis are identifiable. They form the extremist end in the scale of Islamic theology. We therefore refer to them as ultra-traditionalists. But who are the opponents of the Hanbalis? Goldsier describes the others as traditionalists who were somehow influenced by Mu'tazili doctrines, I quote, somehow influenced by Mu'tazili doctrines who might consider such an interpretation blasphemous, unquote. These scholars, according to Goldsier, quote, were of the opinion which soon was to come for also among orthodox circles that this Maqam Mahmud did not mean any particular place, rather, the extent of intercession, Shafar, which will be according to the Prophet as reward for his ceaseless devotion. Unquote. So was there a hadith that expressed the conviction of these unidentified scholars? Where and when did it circulate? Gautier's concluding remark to this analysis reflects his creative and perceptive reading of the historical sources. Quote, each of these two interpretations found their way, their own partisans resulting in violence and death. The military had to be used to control the excess of rage, unquote. Elsewhere, Goldsier mentions that Mujahid's interpretation of Quran 1779 was fully adopted by the traditionalists. But how did this process of adopting this tradition or the other came about? <clears throat> 
Gautier's brief paragraph on Hadith al-Julus is indeed a signpost that suggests a possible direction for investigation. For that, we are indebted to him. However, the questions that I presented here not only point on the lacuna in his description, they also indicate that we need to make further inquiries before we either embrace or reject his unequivocal observations. The focus of my discussion is Hadith al-Julus, but rather than describing this Hadith's role in, in Baghdadi politics, a limited topic which was already exhausted by Gaultier, Kern, and the others, I suggest examining the circulation of this text and the scholars who were interested in its circulation. When we read Gaultier's description of Hadith al-Julus in the public scene of Baghdad, we are astonished by his ability to build a wide and detailed picture from an historical entry which holds no more than 30 words. It is more probable that Gaultier based his sharp analysis not only on the historical entry by Ibn al-Athir, but also on Atabari's interpretation of Quran 1779. I suspect that somehow this reference to Atabari was omitted from the manuscript of Die Richtungen der Islamischen Quran Auslegung. We see two brief mentions of this interpretation in, the, in this work by Goldsiher, but his observations there remain undeveloped and rather mystifying, as he did not corroborate his argument with textual evidence. With the assumption that Goldsiher's description of Mujahid and his Hadith al-Julus is based on his reading of At-Tabari's interpretation of Quran 1779, let us examine At-Tabari's interpretation of this verse. In my reading, I applied both isnad and literary analysis. Now, the technique of isnad analysis started with Joseph Schach, developed uh, uh, by Gautier, Hendrik, uh, Albert Yinbol, and was uh, uh, remodified and perfected by Harald Motzki. Motzki's method of analyzing isnad and matin together, what is called isnad cum matin, considers the variance or different version of a certain hadith as inherent results of the process of oral and even written transmission. In the case of theological hadith, isnad analysis yields tremendous results that cannot be retrieved from the narrative of the standard sources like chronicles, works of tafsir and theological treatises. So I'm I, I hope that I can prove it here in, in the next uh, few minutes. <clears throat> when we read Atabari's interpretation of Quran 1779, as Goldsier probably did, we notice that Atabari quotes a massive amount of a hadith, in fact, 22 a hadith, which interpret Maqam Mahmud as Shafa'a, intercession. Namely, Maqam Mahmud is Muhammad's role as an intercessor in the day of resurrection. So this, is, this interpretation is ta'wil, figurative interpretation, and not literal interpretation. These hadith are roughly divided in two groups. The first group presents an elaborate narrative which describes three scenes in details. The gathering of the resurrected, the hardships they encounter in their way to the place of judgment, and Muhammad's capacity as an intercessor. The second group, which is more interesting, presents a brief dictum which states that Al-Maqam al-Mahmud is intercession. An example to the brief dictum is the following version, which is attributed to the Sahabi Ibn Abbas. So, Haddathana Sulaiman ibn Umar, Umar ibn Khalid al-Ruqiy, Qala Haddathana Isa ibn Yunus, An Rishdina ibn Quraybin, An Abihi, An Nibni Abbasin, Qawlahu, Asa an Yabathaka, Rabbuka, Maqam al Mahmud, and Qala al Maqam al Mahmud, Maqam al Shafa'a. So after Ibn Abbas recited this verse, he said that the honorable place or honorable station is the place or station of intercession. So let us label this hadith and the 21 variants that Atabari quotes as Hadith al-Shafa. Uh, we see uh, that Hadith al-Shafa, as Atabari quotes it, all the 22 variants, has three important characteristics. The narrators are either prominent Sahaba, or at least Tabi'un. It is Khabar al Hadi, a text transmitted by several narrators. However, only two of them are Sahaba. Uh, 
and the other links in the Isnad are reliable or fairly reliable hadith transmitters. Therefore, the text was labeled as an authentic sahih, or at the very least, fair Hassan. Here I should add that Hadith al-Shafa in its several variants is also included in the six canonical hadith compilations and in the Musnad of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So continuing our reading at Tabari's text, we also notice that he quotes Hadith al-Julus. Tabari provides only one version of this text. Tabari includes another Hadith uh, which supports the interpretation provided by Mujahid, but I will not discuss it here. So this is Hadith al-Julus. Hadathana Abad ibn Yaquba, etc., etc. Hadathana ibn Fudaylin an Laythin an Mujahidin fi qawlihi asa an yabathaka rabbuka maqaman mahmudan qala yujlisuhu ma'hu ala arshihi. According to the hierarchical grading of the scholars of hadith, this hadith yields probable knowledge because it goes back to one transmitter only. Khabar al Wahid, the transmitter, of course, or the narrator, is, um, is Mujahid, who was a tabi'i. Hence, the text is um, marked as Maqtu. This iconic text, at least in the eyes of the Hanabila of Baghdad, is not included in the six canonical hadith compilations and not even in Ahmad ibn Hanbal's Musnad. A closer look at the Isnad reveals why. Abad ibn Yaqub al-Asadi, who died at uh, 250 from Kufa, was known as Muhaddith al-Shia. A tabari heard him in person, but nonetheless inserted only four or five of al asadis transmissions in his tafsir. Muhammad ibn Fudail, a muhaddith from Kufa, was also inclined towards the Shia. Laith ibn Sulaim, also from Kufa, was one of Mujahid's closest disciples, and we date his scholarly activity as early as the middle of the 2nd slash 8th century. Based on what Gautier presumably read in a Tabarist tafsir, he constructed, so I believe, the brief analysis which outlines the following narrative. First, there was Hadith al-Julus, attributed to Mujahid. The Hanbalis adopted this text. As a result, the traditionalists with rationalistic tendencies who were, quote, influenced by Mu'tazili doctrines, unquote, were offended by the blunt suggestion that the Prophet and God sit together on the throne, so they circulated Hadith al-Shafa. To fight the harmful text, the traditionalists started circulating two versions of this Hadith. Each version had variants which totaled at 22. Gautier inferred so, I believe, from the high number of the variants of Hadith al-Shafa that Hadith al-Shafa, quote, soon was to come to the fore also among orthodox circles, unquote. In other words, the intensive circulation resulted with the victory of Hadith al-Shafa over Hadith al-Julus. This remark by Gautier is substantiated by the fact that Hadith al-Shafa was canonized while Hadith al-Julus was mentioned only in Hanbali treatises and non-canonical Hadith compilations. Gautier does not say that Hadith al-Shafa was fabricated, but he suggests that the circulation of this text came as a response to the circulation of Hadith al-Julus. In sum, I suspect that Gautier concluded that Hadith al-Shafa came, came to the fore simply because he located Atabari's subtle preference of Hadith al-Shafa over Hadith al-Julus in, uh, and this is what we see here. The text here says, this is a tabari saying, wa'awla al-qawlayni, the preferred um, between the two opinions, namely whether Maqam uh, Mahmud is Shafa or whether Maqam Mahmud is uh, Julus, awla al-qawlayni fi thalika bis-sawab ma sahabihi al-khabaru an rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, وَذَلِكَ مَا حَدَّثَنَا بِهِ أَبُو كُرَيْبٍ etc. etc. عَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ عَسَّانْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا سُعِلَ عَنْهَا قَالَ هِيَ شَفَّا So here Tabari states that between Hadith al-Julus and Hadith al-Shafa, the latter text prevails. He states that this text is authentic, مَا صَحَبِهِ الْخَبَرُ the text is attributed to the Sahabi Abu Huraira and it goes back to the Prophet. That means that this is a Hadith Marfu'. Ah. 
So someone had to teach this text and vouch for its veracity, otherwise it would not have gained this status that it gained. So when we realize, we analyze, when we analyze the isnad of this hadith, we realize that we cannot categorically state, as Goldziher did, that this text started circulating after Hadith al-Julus was circulated. The identifiable links in the Isnad suggest that this text was also taught in Kufa as early as the middle of the 2nd 8th century. We note that At-Tabari received this text from his teacher Abu Quraib. Abu Quraib received the text from the prominent scholar Waqi ibn Jarrah, who received it from Daud ibn Yazid. The fact that 80 years separate between Abu Quraib's and Waqi's death calls into question the probability that this text was indeed transmitted from Yaqi to Abu Quraib, although this is possible. Another problem posed by this text is the reputation of its transmitters. Both Waqi and Daud were often accused of tadlis, citing Isnad in an ambiguous matter, as we see here with the mention of Daoud's father. This, is, this means ambiguity. Yet Waqi was still considered one of the great muhaddithun of his generation. All three scholars were Kufan. This particular version of Hadith Shafa was included in Sunan Tirmidhi and in Ahmad ibn Hanbal's uh, Musnad. So there is another version of, uh, there are other versions, of course, of Hadith al-Shafa, uh, which were attributed to transmitters who enjoyed more credibility. These versions were included even in the most prestigious Sahih al-Bukhari, although not in Sahih Muslim, and the canonical Hadith compilations of At-Tirmidhi ibn Majah, Sijistani, Nasai, and also in Ahmad ibn Hanbal's Musnad. Summing up. The results of the Isnad analysis do not support Gautier's conviction that Hadith al-Julus came, uh, came first and Hadith al-Shafa second, but they do not disprove them either. We therefore need to take a different approach when we consider Gautier's remark of the precedence of Hadith al-Julus. Perhaps we should not compare Hadith al-Julus with any version of Hadith al-Shafa because there is no basis for comparison. We should seek for an explanation for Gautier's remark elsewhere. So I believe that Gautier easily located this text uh, that, and that this text should be compared to Mujahid's Hadith al-Julus. And this text says, again, an Mujahid fi qawli lahi maqaman mahmudan qala shafa'atu muhammadin yawm al qiyamati the basis of comparison is, of course, Mujahid himself. Here, Mujahid interprets Maqam Mahmud figuratively as Muhammad's intercession in the day of resurrection. And we see this interpretation also in the tafsir that is attributed to Mujahid. So before we read the text, let us be reminded that Gautia was the first scholar to draw attention to Mujahid's Quranic exegesis and to its rationalist ten tendencies. As Claude Gilliot described it, the several pages that Gautier wrote about Mujahid in Die Richtungen were epoch-making, no less. Mujahid and his tafsir, which he dictated to his disciples, were ex extremely important for the development of Islamic theology. His dicta, which developed into full-fledged theories, reflected his independence and creativity as an exegete. He certainly expressed his rai, his opinion, and his hermeneutics sometimes bore distinctive rationalistic ideas. His opinions were therefore disseminated by Mu'tazilis and Shi'is, as Gautier was the first to observe. So Mujahid dictated his tafsir to his disciples, and they transmitted the material to their disciples. Going back to Hadith al-Shafa, which is attributed to Mujahid, we learn that At-Tabari received this version of the Hadith from two different uh, teachers. At-Tabari is down. He should be up, but I, I didn't know how to do it, so he's down. And it goes from, you know, from modern to ancient. This is the way it goes. Anyhow. I will learn it for next time. So, uh, al tabari the Yeah, the color, the color is off. It was okay in the, so yeah, I, sorry. So I'm going to, to read it to you and I, I hope that it will be clear now. So we learned that al tabari received this version of the hadith from two different teachers. Al-Harith ibn Muhammad and Muhammad ibn Amr ibn Abbas al-Bahili. 
Both transmitted the same version <coughs> of the hadith which came from Mujahid's uh, disciple. Mujahid is on top. His disciple is Ibn Abi Najih. And um, Ibn Abi Najih was based in Mecca. So two, there are two roots of this hadith that we see here. One is Ibn Abi Najih to Isa Ibn Maymun uh, to Abu Asim to Al-Bahili. And the other is um, Warqa Ibn Umar to uh, Al-Hassan Al-Ashyab to Al-Harith Ibn Muhammad. So these roots provide um, most of the material from Mujahid's tafsir, which Atabari used in his um, uh, Jami al-Bayan. The first chain from, uh, from the right, um, we see 2,063 occurrences in um, Atabari's Jami al-Bayan. The second chain, only 1,291. If we, we compare these two roots of transmission to the recension of life from which Atabari drew Hadith al-Julus, then there is no comparison. The root in which life's recension was transmitted appears only 270 times in Tafsir al-Tabari. While a life's material circulated mainly in Kufa, the material attributed to Ibn Abi Najih circulated in Basra, Kufa, and Baghdad. So according to life, Mujahid interpreted Maqam Mahmud literally. But according to Ibn Abi Najih, Mujahid interpreted Maqam Mahmud figuratively. We now understand that Gautier's rather cryptic paragraph in the Richtungen referred to a controversy among the Muhaddithun of the 2nd 8th century and not to the turmoil that occurred uh, in Baghdad in the 4th century. So, and indeed, when Gautier mentioned the traditionalists with their rationalistic tendencies who were, quote, influenced by Mu'tazili doctrines, unquote, and who were responsible for the proliferation of Hadith al-Shafa, he surely referred to Ibn Abi Najih, who was accused of being a Qadari and a Mu'tazili at the same time, which is almost the same thing. So his rationalistic tendencies, and as the tendencies of other links in these isnads, like Isa ibn Maymun, did not escape Gautier's attention. We arrive now at the, end, at the third and last part of this uh, talk. So in 2018, I described how the Hanbalis uh, chose Hadith al-Julus as an icon of their creed. Uh, the process did not start with Ahmad ibn Hanbal and his son Abdullah, although Hanbali sources, of course, claim that both Ahmad and Abdullah vouch for the veracity and authenticity of Hadith al-Julus. The great canonizer of Ahmad ibn Hanbal's teaching, Ahmad ibn Muhammad Abu Bakr al-Marwazi or al-Marwazi, was responsible for the transformation of Hadith al-Julus from a marginal hadith to an iconic text. Al-Maruzi and his fellow Hanbalis started a massive process of proliferating this text, a process which is recorded in detail in Kitab al-Sunnah by Abu Bakr al-Khalal. Among other things, Hanbalis were required to accept this hadith as part of their creed and to publicly profess their faith in this text. The process continued well to the 6th century, that's 12th century common era. And this is the text that we see here. So what we see here is a paragraph from a creed, Ritiqad, authored by uh, Ibn Abi Ya'la, as I said, who was the son of the famous Qadi of Baghdad, Abu Ya'la ibn al-Farah. Abu al-Hussain was a mufti, but his fame uh, came from two things. First, because he was the son of Abu Ya'la, who is considered to date one uh, of the most prominent scholars of Hanbalism. And second, Ibn Abi Ya'la is famous for Tabaqat al-Hanabila, the biographical dictionary that he composed on the Hanbalis since the third uh, to the fifth centuries. So Ibn Abi Ya'la's death end, by the way, was also tragic. He was uh, more than 70 years old when his servants robbed him and murdered him in his house in Baghdad. So the manuscript of this text was discovered 20 years ago in the Zahiriya Library in Damascus uh, by Dr. Muhammad ibn Abdurrahman al-Khamis, a professor of Islamic theology in the Imam Muhammad ibn Saud Islamic University in Riyadh. From the Samaat, from the declarations on the sessions in which the text was recited and by a certified teacher, so from the Samaat of this text we learn that only 30 years after the murder of Ibn Abi Ya'la, there was a 
public reading of the text in the Hanbali section of the Great Mosque in, in Damascus. Like many texts uh, that the Hanbalis of Baghdad authored, this creed circulated among the Hanbali communities of Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine during the 6th um, and 7th centuries. So the text's root and other textual evidence indicate that this text was indeed very important. So what we see here in the text, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to speak about it a little bit, is that this is the end of the canonization of Hadith al-Julus. There is one anonymous Hanbali by the name of Ibn Umayr who says, Sami'atu Abba Abdallah Ahmad bin Hanbal was su'ila an Hadith Mujahid. Um, I heard that uh, someone asked um, Ahmad ibn Hanbal about Hadith al-Julus, and Ahmad's response was, قَتَلَ قَتْهُ الْعُلَمَاءُ بِالْقَبُولِ نُسَلِّمُ هَذَا الْخَبَرَ كَمَا جَاءَ and so on and so forth. So this paragraph, so what we see here uh, in the text is how the Hanbalis attributed to Ahmad ibn Hanbal Hadith al-Julus, or the necessity to transmit Hadith al-Julus literally without, as they say, bila kaifa, without uh, asking about uh, the mo modality, about how exactly Muhammad sits on the throne with God. I reach to the conclusion. So I think that the case of Hadith al-Julus illustrates that Gaultier's well-known skeptical approach to the Hadith is absent when it comes to the theological Hadith. Gaultier's reading of the theological Hadith is mostly acceptive, as it takes the testimony of the sources at face value. Moreover, Gaultier combines his reading of the theological Hadith with systematic readings in the prosopographical literature. And so, while Goldseher preceded the technique of his NAD analysis by several decades, he was attentive to what the sources had to say, at least on the immediate transmitters of a given hadith, be it a Sahabi or a Tabi, and even more transmitters, later transmitters in the chain of transmission. And a final word, if you allow me. In his tremendously interesting introduction to Goldsier's Oriental Diary, the Jewish historian and anthropologist Raphael Patai describes the classes he took in the University of Breslau. Probably you know this anecdote, but I couldn't help myself and I'm retelling it. So Patai uh, studied with the greatest Orientalist of uh, his generation, Karl Brockermann. Patai testifies, quote, I distinctly remember that of the many dozens of scholars whose works and opinions he, Brockelmann, quoted, Goldziher was the only one whom he termed great. There was scarcely a lecture period when he did not say, Under Grosse Goldziher sagt, and the great Goldziher says. So a century after Goldziher's death, his provocative thought, illuminating observations, and categorical remarks are not quoted as much not in my field, in, in the field of traditionalist uh, theology. You, you will have to take my word for it. There are researchers who ignore his thought completely, and sadly for them, they publish their work without bothering to check what the Grosse Goldsier sagte. However, if we bring our work to a halt for just a minute and uh, look uh, into Gautier's writings, we are bound to find treasures that are simply waiting to be excavated, ideas and thoughts that Gautier generously dispersed in his work that need more polishing and developing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Livnat, for your detailed lecture. <laughs> we have plenty of time for questions, so if anyone would like to uh, ask one, now is the time. Maybe. Eta. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, thank you for your interesting lecture. Can you tell us what was the Shia's attitude to the Hadith during the centuries, if at all? Thank you for this question. Uh, as I said, this is only a preliminary, uh, pre preliminary uh, research. So it's not only the beginning of something, and I didn't check. Uh, whether the Shiites uh, disseminated or circulated this uh, text. But as I, as I showed, um, the text was 
started circulating by Muhammadun um, with Shiite tendencies or even Shiites, like Ibn Abi Najih who was a Shiite. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's only partially relevant to the interesting thing you said. You know, in, in, in Shi sources, you often find works of Tabari which are very clearly pro Ali, pro Shi. It has a work called Hadith of Walaya, which has not survived, but which is quoted. So, so when he was accused of Arab, it's, I mean, what your, your explanation, of course, is correct one, I think, but there's another end that he, he also have been accused of corrupt because of his very pronounced pro I mean, views, at least as they, as they are expressed in those works of his. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just a small comment. I think that uh, this Muhammad Mudras in Shi uh, exegesis is always interpreted as a very good shot. Never, never the other option is really small. The far as I can recall. Muhammad would be equal to and not the Janice, the Jews of Shri is not involved there as far as I can remember. Any further questions? Yochanan. If there are any, I, I suppose you have not dealt with uh, the modern developments of the interpretation of this hadith, but maybe uh, it also will reveal some significant results. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sure that it will. Uh, I, I went as far as Ibn Taymiyyah, this is the only modern stuff that I went with. And of course, Ibn Taymiyyah accepts hadith beliefs entirely because. In the 14th century, it's part of Hanbali Creek, but again, you are right that I should probably check further and see what, what is said today about this Hanbali Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when in my paper, uh, Goldsier um, characterized the Islamic West as a place in which the common people intervened in this kind of um, religious discussions, but he seems to assume that in the East that this did not happen, that the common people had no role. But it's very clear that he knew that uh, there was this intervention of the common people also in, uh, in these religious matters. And I was wondering if he comments anything about uh, this uh, protagonism and this intervention of the common people. Thank you for your uh, remark. Um, Gautier writes about the Hanbalis uh, not in the, the Richtungen uh, as much as in the, uh, in the lectures on Islam, uh, the Boresmen. So uh, what, uh, what he says there uh, is really vague and he didn't go into details. But I think that uh, as we go further in Hanbali, uh, in Hanbali uh, material, uh, not only the cosmographical material and chronicles, but also in the creeds, we can see that indeed the commoners were very interested in these questions and they participated. Uh, they did not uh, discuss it; they just, you know, they just hit others or smack others, but not uh, discuss. Uh, so thank you for this comment. Sorry, I didn't hear the word. Make any comment regarding the no, 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 he did, he, no, he did not. As far as I know, he did not. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, do you have an explanation for this methodological distinction that you mentioned? Uh, Briefly, between theological hadith and legal hadith? Well, I, I think it's not, a, it's not a matter of methodology, it's more a, met, a matter of approach. Walter was famous for his skeptical view when it came uh, to the discussion about uh, the hadith about Jerusalem 
and uh, the Haram Sharif and all the material uh, uh, that, uh, that was involved in the uh, sanctuary of, the, of Jerusalem, the uh, sanctity of Jerusalem. So, uh, but when what I saw in the Rechungen in the specific two chapters that I'm familiar with about traditionalistic uh, uh, interpretation and enigmatic interpretation is that he really um, he, he accepts, for instance, he accepts the, the fact that Mujahid uh, said one thing, this is receptive, but he says that the, the, the figurative interpretation was uh, attributed to him later. So this is not entirely uh, receptive, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit skeptical. Um, I think that uh, also what we see also in, uh, in matters of theology, uh, the sources are more um, straightforward. When you read Hanbalis, they say this is uh, fabricated, this is not fabricated. I think that he also uh, tells us what he read. For instance, he, he read, uh, I was referring to uh, uh, Ibn Shihab al Pastelani, um, an, an interpreter of a uh, hadith uh, compilation of the uh, So, uh, what al Pastelani says, al Pastelani is an Ashari theologian. What he says, Goltzir brings to us without question, and we see it uh, in the book uh, about the Zahiris. Uh, Adam, you asked about the Zahiris. In the book about the Zahiris, Goltzir provides no analysis. He just tells us what Pastelani does. So, in some cases, he's skeptical. Maybe it was a matter of age, I don't know, maturity. I think that as we mature and advance, we tend to accept more of what the sources say and be less skeptical and less innovative. That's my, my understanding of the reading these sources. 